Uh, hello, welcome to Parsons Communication Design Lecture Series for the fall 2022. My name is Yirun Kang, uh, Associate Director of the program. And as you know, CD Lecture Series is a uh, place for CD students to meet uh, design thinkers and uh, practitioners within the discipline and the, in the uh, adjacent fields. The lecture takes place in every two weeks on Fridays, 3 p.m. Eastern throughout the semester. And we have had some amazing speakers already in the semester and there's more, so uh, please stay tuned. You can find out more, uh, more about uh, these lectures and uh, this lecture and the upcoming lectures uh, from the CD app. And also you can look at the past lectures from our YouTube channel. Um, today, uh, our speaker is Jonathan Hanahan who is an artist, a critical designer, and educator who uses technology to critique technology. His uh, speculative practice explores the physical, cultural, and social ramifications of digital experiences and the role of technology plays in shaping our everyday realities. Hanahan received his BARC from Virginia Tech and his MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design and is currently an associate professor in the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University in St. Louis. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Jonathan, and the room is yours. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna try to rip through this bunch of stuff pretty quickly. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm Jonathan Hanahan, um, coming to you from St. Louis, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my practice that sort of weaves a bunch of different disciplinary experiences, uh, together. Um, so as a brief timeline, um, I'm just going to start kind of where all these things came from. Um, not necessarily why they're important geographically, but how each one of these sort of stops changed my perspective of what I was gonna be, you know, or what I thought I wanted to be or what I thought I wanted to do as a creative practitioner. So um, I started off uh, as an architect. I went to, I have a five year professional architecture degree that I don't, uh, technically used, but I think has a huge influence on how I approach communication design, design in general, and really like technology. So I, I graduated in 2008 and moved to Boston, which was a really bad time to be an architect, um, and worked a super corporate architecture job. Um, and, you know, drawing the sort of classical uh, drawing bathroom details all day long, working on projects that were never really going to exist. Um, and then I had an opportunity, but I always had kind of one foot outside of architecture. Um, I, I, I love that. I love that education. I love that sort of foundation, but to me, it was really slow and sort of sacrificial. And, you know, I, I, I was looking for something that had a little bit more tempo. So in 20, 2009, I moved to Amsterdam and I worked for an architecture magazine called Volume. Um, and that was like this shift away from designing buildings, um, but thinking about um, sort of maintaining that rigor and, and sort of passion. But something about um, the magazine that I found fascinating was um, we would work for three months. It was a quarterly, quarterly magazine. We would work for three months on something um, and then uh, the opportunity to then like hold that thing in my hand and then also give that out to a bunch of people was re really sort of changed my trajectory of like what I wanted to do. So um, that after my time there, I went back to Boston and worked for another studio that did more. We did architecture, but we did a lot of like exhibition design, graphic design. And so those sort of like faster, more tangible, more narrative focus projects became really interesting to me. Um, that's what led me to go to RISD um, because I was sort of, I think a lot of, uh, I wanted to have a really sort of technical, deep graphic design education. Instead of pretending to be a graphic designer, I wanted to be like, I really wanted to know what I was talking about. So I went to RISD and actually the, you know, the going there thinking, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to design books. I'm going to do 
um, you know, have a traditional graphic design practice. The moment I got there was when I sort of shifted away or um, was this realization that the internet was not a flat place to just put posters that I had designed, but was actually like an occupiable, messy, complicated uh, physical space. And that sort of brought me back to this whole understanding of architecture. Um, and so a lot of the work I'm gonna show here is about kind of using tools to, um, just to kind of try to understand what these digital spaces are, um, mostly for me, but also as ways to kind of share those things. So um, this, um, this idea of like magic is something that I think is really interesting. Um, and I think a lot of our jobs as designers is to maintain this idea of, um, or this sort of veil of magic, especially in regards to technology. So for most, many of us, it's our job to simplify things, clarify things, make things feel as if they are special. And that those metaphors are kind of still used and and uh, propagated through everything we do. But really the idea is that like, we metaphorically try to build this space that the cloud is this magical thing, but it's really these types of things, right? Like these messy, complicated, um, ugly places. And then these places, which are more politically or morally or ethically complicated. So these are the data centers and, um, you know, spaces where, all of our information ends up uh, you know, on, a, on a daily basis, right? Every, every interaction we have with technology ends up in a space like this. So um, my work's really about this idea of not making new technology, but finding ways to visualize our experiences with them um, and, and validating or, you know, breaking down that that role that art and design plays in teaching other people uh, or giving them opportunities to understand what, what their decisions uh, lead to becomes really important. So this is a practice that I've defined as uh, making thick interfaces. This, is a, um, this actually came out of my thesis work at RISD and has kind of been the backbone of things that I've been doing ever since. Um, and the idea of a thick interface is um, creating disruptive experiences with really familiar technologies, momentarily disrupting them, um, and then putting them back in a way that we can kind of reevaluate our relationships with them. So I like to think of them as like, the more familiar the experience, the more powerful the, the disruption can be. And the idea that they're not just these like sort of, that experiences with technology are not just these sort of clear windows or these sort of clear passages from one space to another, but they actually have to kind of change state uh, and, and I have to be disruptive in some way. So the work that I'm trying to do is trying to be more of like this filter than this, just this window um, that in that moment that it passes through the filter, it changes and then it goes right back to the way it was. And so this is an example of the type of work I, I find really interesting. So this is a piece by uh, an artist named Hans, Hans Hermet. Um, and so what he did was built all of these different size shoes um, and then asked people come, to come into the room and put on a particular pair of shoes based off of how tall they are. And so what that does is create this type of experience where every single person in the room is now exactly the same height. Um, so the, ex you know, the experience is familiar. It's just a it's a party, it's a, it's a gathering, it's a conversation, but you have this moment where this really tall guy on the left and this much shorter woman on the right are now um, at perfect eye level, right? Um, it sort of changes that, that familiar experience momentarily. And then we take the shoes off and we leave the room and go back to normal with that new sort of understanding of what that experience sort of taught us, right? So. This is sort of kind of foundational to how I try to think about the work that I do. And a lot of it is about, for me, finding ways to understand the work that I make is about how I, it's how I grapple with these things that are happening every day. Like I love the internet. I love technology. I love all these things, but they also terrify me. 
Um, and so I want to make work that both for myself and for others kind of helps unpack what those decisions are. Like, I understand that these things aren't going away and that's fine as long as we really, um, as, as long as we're rooted and we understand um, what our relationship is to them. So um, my, I, I have, uh, the way that I approach this is like a couple of really key process oriented steps. Like I'm really interested in a procedural process where um, much of my work is just about like finding and connecting the right subject matter with the right tool and then just letting it run. So the output is much less interesting to me. Like I'm much more interested in this creating the system that then executes a thing um, and then doing that over and over and over again. Um, I'm really interested in like using old or defunct or um, obsolete technologies um, in new ways or using technologies in, in ways that they are not intended to be used. Um, the uh, again sort of reinforcing this idea that the output is much more the input and the structure is really where i'm most fascinated in that the output is just a result of that process um this idea of doing something over and over and over again and so um a lot of the work is about sort of this like idea of quality through quantity um the more there is and the more they sort of have relationships with each other um the more the difference between them is interesting. So this that's the sort of repetition and non-standardization. And the last is again, sort of these old architecture terms that I've re, um, reshifted into um, how I approach art and design is um, this idea that like we can have simple forms with complex experiences or complex forms with simple experiences, but we can't have simple and simple, and we can't have complex and complex. So you can relate that to architecture in that you can have a building that is a really simple box, but has a really complex space on the inside because that because the exterior form is simple, or you can have a really kind of crazy bombastic building, but the, the resulting spaces inside are very simple. So, and if we have a simple box and simple space that makes boring outputs, and complex forms and complex space makes chaotic environments. So similarly to our experiences with technology is that that sort of ratio is really important. And I'm, I'm constantly sort of trying to like turn the dial in how to take familiar simple forms and then push them into complex unexpected experiences. So I'm gonna show a couple of projects that kind of go through this. Um, and then we'll have, I guess we'll have some time at the end. So. Uh, the first that I'm going to show is this project uh, from 2017 called the 45th City, um, which was, you know, 2016, 2017 was an in sort of disruptive political moment. Um, I was making a bunch of like weird work about like dating on the internet that at that time then felt really, I don't know, lost or unnecessary. Uh, and then I came across this image that kind of spit me down a really weird pathway. But this was this is an image from the early 2000s, which was um, a map of the Internet. So this is like a map of hyperlink structures between websites on the Internet. So it's sort of like beautiful uh, astrological thing. And in and in 2016, I found this image, which is an updated version of the Internet, an updated map of the Internet. Um, and what this is showing is similarly like the main spaces that we spend a lot of our time, but all these things on the exterior edge, these sort of cancerous parasitic forms are all fake news websites and like um, sort of these farms of uh, non-trustworthy content. Um, so that, and you can see how these work is that they are, they sort of live at the periphery and they're searching for an opportunity to get fed into any of the you know walled gardens that we spend a lot of time in particularly facebook instagram um you know twitter etc uh, because what those things do that designers live in those work in those spaces to make sure that anything that's fed into facebook looks like facebook so 
the sort of like disruptive content is paired very closely with uh, trustworthy information and sort of sets the table that um, fake news or this sort of like this is not necessarily a, a problem of content. There's always been this stuff around. It's really more a problem. Like it's a design problem. Like it's a problem that we've sort of created. So what I started to look at was I found this tool a long time ago called Tilt 3D, which is a um, browser extension that allows you to look at websites in three dimensions. Um, it was sort of intended to be this functional tool. It sort of evolved just into like a toy that lets you look at websites in 3D. Um, and I, what I just did was I decided to build this list. Um, I, I built this list of noted fake or malicious websites. Um, and the process was then just to feed all these websites into this inspector and sort of see what those results are. So um, this is sort of what a reliable website looks like. This is the New York Times, where it's this sort of low, efficient, structural thing, right? Um, there, and that's largely because you know organizations like the New York Times have teams of people working to make that website as efficient, elegant, um, and run as fast as possible, uh, et cetera. This is what a fake news website tends to look like where they are much taller. There's a much more junk. There's a lot of like floating things or, you know, shifting things. And that's all really one because the, you know, the structure is really poor, but also many of these sites are just full of clickbait and garbage. That's just trying to push itself up to the top. Um, so you know, you get these sort of weird tall towers. You can see in this one, this like long thing is this massive comment tree. So the, the, the news article is very small. There's not a lot of content and it's all just this sort of comment tree. Um, so I basically just built this big list of, um, or this big archive of cities based off of all these places. Um, and uh, then the, the, the process was then to directly take that model, feed it into a 3D printer, and then just output it as a physical form. Um, so again, like my goal was to not, uh, to have as little um, abstraction built into this. Like the, the process of going from the 3D model to the 3D print to a physical object meant that there was no sort of shift, like, I wasn't making any aesthetic decisions that might change the thing. It was intended to be just directly uh, what, what it was. So, um, and then the, the next piece of the project was I actually took some of these and worked with an architectural renderer whose job is to make renderings of real or future or speculative cities. And we skinned these things um, as if they were real places. So we thought about like, what types of content should be what types of material, um, what would this place feel like as a, phys you know, what would it, what would it mean to occupy it? Um, and so the work sort of sits in this like duality of this like large scale abstract physical object. And then this sort of narratively oriented um, rendering of the, both of the same place. Um, and the idea was that you would kind of approach these objects as, um, assuming them to be a real city or to be a real thing of architecture and only sort of understand the the digital undertones of it after sort of experiencing it just as a formal piece. So this is just a, uh, this is a show that was in Boston kind of showing different aspects of the, of the pieces. Um, and yeah, so the next work was about taking this idea of like collecting, uh, collecting existing websites and turning them into physical objects and saying, what happens if I design websites with the goal of them being physical sculptural entities? So in a similar way, um, I was playing with this like very recursive nature of, of code and of, and of markup and, and thinking about making an object 
and then nesting it inside of itself over and over and over again to create a complex form. So this the 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 div is a simple thing, but the recursive use of it creates complexity. So um, these were just some early experiments of like taking familiar things and nesting them inside of them, each other to create complex forms. Um, and again, sort of trying to blur that physical, digital, sort of spatial um, idea. Um, there's another one that I, I think is a really good example where at, there's moments where the sort of physical things and then the digital, the UI starts to kind of embed itself into physical spaces in an interesting way. So um, uh, yeah, so these are early experiments. And then the work turned into these like simple um, animated websites um, that would just sort of like float back and forth. Um, so this is just like, this would just sort of, uh, yeah, play. Um, and then as a physical or as an, as a three-dimensional object starts to look like this, where there's just things nested inside of themselves. Um, so this is another one, which is just these sort of bars that would shift back and forth. Um, and then it results in these sort of like wing shaped, um, uh, forms. And so the work was, I kind of basically took those sites and then output them as these physical objects through laser cutting and just sort of like assembly. And I think what was most interesting in this process was like these websites prop, like once I kind of designed the thing took 10 minutes to make because it was just nesting itself over and over and over again. These sculptures took weeks to make, right? Where they're the same sort of thing, but the sort of labor of like all of the cutting, all of the organization, all of the glue, et cetera, sort of adds this sort of duality and makes the, um, it sort of celebrates digital space as this land of, um, of no rules, right? Like we don't have to follow, we don't have to worry about what something weighs. Um, we don't have to take into consideration gravity, material, um, inconsistencies of material. Um, so yeah, it's sort of formally, they sort of read as these flat spaces and then in three dimensions become these much more complex um, environments. Oh, man. How am I doing on time? Good, okay. Um, so the, the third uh, piece that I wanted to show is something I've been working on the past couple of years, which is, again, sort of thinking about the idea of um, the physical implications of digital experiences. Um, and I came across these Kevin McKelvey images a while ago, where he was um, visiting these illegal e-waste dump sites um, and photographing the people who live in those spaces and scavenge through our old technologies to find rare earth minerals that they can then make a living off of. And I, I found that sort of juxtaposition, like both sort of terrifying and um, really intriguing at the same time. Um, and so I was, I, I started doing this e-waste research and um, getting really interested in like what happens to these things when they, you know, when they are, when they leave us um, and what is the implication of them? Because there's this weird sort of duality where as these things get like smaller and thinner and lighter, they are made of more recyclable things. Like the contents of our devices are quote unquote more recyclable, but the processes that make them small and thin and light make them less possible to be recycled. So in the simplest terms, like the smaller a thing gets, the less it can be screwed together and has to be soldered or glued or you know welded together, which change the physical properties of it and make those materials less, um, much harder to extract, right? So companies might have proprietary means to, to extract them. But what ends up happening is they either live on our shelf or they 
get shipped off somewhere. And these are these places, um, this is where they get shipped off to. And then people go through really dangerous, toxic, destructive ways to extract those things. So all of these fires are uh, mounds of cables that are being burnt to remove the plastic coating to get at the copper and all the sort of materials that are valuable, right? So, um, and I, I really enjoyed this quote that sort of mentions that we are reaching a point where mining the quantity of rare earth minerals on the surface is increasingly more than what we could mine from the earth, meaning that it's already in all of the stuff that we have. And so finding new ways to like extract that is going to become increasingly important. So in thinking about this, I was looking at a lot of images of these places and also kind of reflecting on the environment that um, this is the urban environment that I was in and noticing these sort of parallels between um, these e-waste dump sites and the sort of periphery of the urban condition that I was living in. And I was kind of speculating that in continuing this process, um, there will come a time where we won't be sh shipping these things off, that they're kind of out of sight and out of mind, but they'll start to kind of live at the periphery of everyday life. And I, I sort of uh, hypothesizing that that place is this sort of edgeland condition, this sort of like the the boundary between the rural and the and the urban, and that which is sort of this growing tension between nature and civilization, right? So these, um, I just started, so I'm noticing these patterns, right, of um, things that are happening next to me and things that are happening far away, um, both sort of like, uh, you know, narrative patterns, but also like structural patterns, right? Um, so uh, what I decided to do was basically um, take these data, image data sets that I was collecting and then breed them together using, uh, I use a software called Runway, which is a machine learning algorithm um, that sort of, and it's basically built, there's a couple of different ones, but this in particular is just a style GAN that you feed it images and then it makes more images based on what it knows. And so the process here is I'm, I'm telling it all of these things are the same, but I'm actually giving it two different data sets and asking it to breed them together. Um, and these are kind of built on patterns that are inside of them, but you can see these two sort of themes came out of here where this whole series of these sort of, these horizons, um, and then there's this series of mounds that sort of uh, result. Um, uh, and, and these images, they're like really, they sort of live on this edge of being really familiar and also foreign at the same time. Um, so that's sort of the process was like building this data set, feeding it into an algorithm, and then asking it to output similar images from this sort of blended or bred, bred data set. So, um, and then the next piece was I went back through all of the images I had and then cataloged the objects um, that are in those. Um, through another machine learning model. Um, and then I would feed these new landscapes into an object detection um, um, model and try to identify these objects in these new landscapes. Um, so the, the way that these are displayed is basically these, uh, they're dis displayed as landscapes um, devoid of the sort of underlying content um and they're 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 i think they're 30 36 by 36 or um so, like large scale prints um and then i built this app this ar app that would allow you to scan those images and then find those identified objects inside of them so through the phone you sort of see the underlying material um but in physical space, they just sort of exist as landscapes. Um, yeah, and so um, the last, the last, the thing that I'm kind of working on right now 
which kind of spawns from that is this idea of these sort of hybrid, building these hybrid data sets, um, feeding them into algorithms that are, you know, it's, it's a sort of a, an experimentation or investigation of bias within, um, within machine learning, right? There's a, there's a million tools that we can use that allow us to generate images um, like Dolly, you know, I'm sure many of you have been kind of playing around with them. Um, and I think what's in, the, what I'm sort of critical of is, um, I'm critical of using those things without knowing what the data set actually is. I'm really interested in the idea of building a data set um, and controlling the data set and just allowing the output to come. So I've been going through this process of saying, like, similar to that Edgelands project of taking two similar but drastically different data sets and breeding them together and creating outcomes that are in the middle space. So um, these are just a couple of things I've been working on recently of these like hybrid, you know, this is like a series of a bunch of faces and a bunch of flowers and then sort of letting them kind of come together in the middle um, and create this sort of like space that bounces and oscillates back and forth between the two, but also creates this overlapping middle space between them. Um, so I think that's what, yeah, let these play a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's all, that's what I have, that's all I have. I, that's 30 minutes on the dot, so uh, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Like this sure. is this yeah, this is really great to see. Like it's it's good to see that like it's great that you kind of walked us through your kind of like various iterations. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and I think yeah, it's uh truly inspiring work. So I uh we are gonna start the QA. So if you guys have any questions, sure. um Please uh, put them in the chat. Um, oh, we have the first one uh, from Nika. Thanks for your awesome presentation. When you share the 3D renderings of websites, I was reminded that people sometimes draw similarities between web design, HTML, and architecture. Seems like your work explores this visually. I'm curious how you feel about this comparison structurally. Yeah, um, I, I think I mentioned uh, earlier um, that it's like one of the most foundational things that I'm interested, what makes me interested in, in, in the internet, uh, sort of in, in that structure, um, is the structural nature of how these things come to be. So as opposed to what's the aesthetic result, but like, what's the underlying elements that like, uh, lead it to be the same and it, ha it happens a lot. I was actually talking with a student earlier about you know she's trying to build a website and um I imagine many of the students think this way too is like bouncing back and forth between these tools like Figma which allow us to like design a thing that looks exactly like we want it um but we have to turn on a different brain to think about how we're actually going to build that thing. I think it's a really valuable skill to, um, you know, as tools get easier for us to not need to know how code works, um, but knowing how it works and understanding it while you're designing is a really powerful um, skill and tool. And so that sort of back and forth, I find really interesting. And, you know, like I said, when I was, a graduate student um, thinking I was just gonna make like beautiful bespoke one-off books. Um, the, like the internet to me was just a place to put pictures of the things that I made. And not until I sort of got into um, the process of how those, how a website is built, did I realize how much it actually, how similar it is to, to architecture, to building a building, you know, sort of starting from, those initial building blocks and then uh, layering them on top of, you know, the difference being that when we make a structure, 
we start at the bottom and we build on top. And when we make a digital, like an app or a website, we're actually starting with like containers and then we're filling them in, right? So you start with like big things and we put smaller things and smaller things and smaller things. And so that sort of back and forth from like the bottom up approach, even like the bottom up approach of, I open a Figma sketch and I start to push stuff around. We It starts at zero and then we add to it. But then the building process of, you know, making that thing real is actually then starting from the big and then like, like going, getting smaller and smaller and nesting things inside of them. So those sort of like, um, you know, um, spatial components uh, are what I'm, I'm really, really interested in. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I also have a question sort of related to that. I also briefly mentioned that like the, it was really nice to see your kind of uh, iterations of your mm -hmm. projects. So you sort of, it looks like you have this core idea. You take this core idea and bring that through sort of many different lens and mediums. And I kind of suspect that like that is like the driving force or even that is possible because the sort of the subject matter is something that you deeply care about or uh, kind of close to your heart in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like in some ways though, in, if that in those cases, like it, I can imagine it being kind of hard to draw a line between, okay, this is a project, this is a hobby, this is just my own, you know, like small interest that I just mm -hmm. spent time just looking and, you know, like researching a little bit, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like there, are, like I can see like, these are just like rhizomatic, small kind of interests here and there. And somehow mm -hmm. you build a project out of this, like connecting a few dots. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, like what your process of that would be? Like, do you ever draw a line between, okay, this is a project, this is a hobby, this is some other thing, or is there some sort of a, I don't know, is there a way for you to kind of think about these things? Yeah, I mean, that's maybe the simplest is that um, sort of the luxury of living in academia is that these can be, um, you know, this is my this is my research, like this is what I do, this is my creative practice. So I I I, I spend a lot of time doing client work and doing more traditional design things and. Um, I, I've re, I, you know, I've started to kind of invert that model and think about how am I, how's the work that I make, you know, kind of go out in a public setting. So I, I, my, I kind of oscillate between like, I still kind of call myself a designer because of the process, but my work doesn't really appear in traditional design spaces. Like I, I sort of disseminate it much more as an artist. So mm. I, you know, even trying to catalog that for, you know, my employer is also kind of difficult because I don't fit in the traditional bucket of the art faculty. And I don't necessarily fit in the, the bucket of the design faculty, but I actually really enjoy that, like the interrelationship of that space. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I'll say too, that like a lot of the process is like, it really helps me to be hand as hands off as possible when these like um i try to make i try to let the content and let the tool or the process make the decisions for me it's really just my job to like plug them together or find the right content and the right tool to mix together so um i'll say like 99% of the work is in just like connecting those things and then once, once I find the connection, then I can just run them. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's really like, um, the output happens very fast, but the build to that output is just like playing with tools and reading about like, you know, I'm trying to find ways to understand these big kind of hairy things that are involved mm -hmm. with, you know, digital experiences. Like I said, I'm like, I love I love the internet. I think it's like the most amazing thing, but I need to understand it because it can, it's, it, it, also, it also terrifies me, right? And this is kind of a way for me to 
unpack those big questions, but also make things that I can put out and other people have that same sort of opportunity to kind of reflect on familiar, uh, familiar experiences in unfamiliar ways. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Another, I mean, another question, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, um, I, another thing that I was kind of curious about is whether, how, how you feel about like not, I'm using air quotes, like not using your our architecture degree in a sort of, you know, in a, in a, in that particular way. Right. Yeah. Um, and is, if there is anything that, like, do you think you have learned some like uh, fundamental foundational skills from, from the sure. degree that you think is, you, you is still part of your practice sure. to this day? Yeah. yeah. I, I wouldn't trade, uh, I wouldn't trade that education for anything like i think it was um hugely influential in the way i think about my design like my practice now um and yeah just because i'm not like a licensed architect doesn't mean that that stuff isn't super valuable and i i mean i honestly think that some of the people i'm most inspired from and i think who are the most interesting thinkers not saying i'm not 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 i'm not putting myself on that pedestal but uh the people that I'm most inspired are by are those that come from different backgrounds and then bring that expertise and filter it through a new lens. So they maybe come to design from a different space or they are designers and then they take that process and enter other disciplines and other fields. And so that that sort of hybrid space, I think, is a huge asset um, moving forward. Like just because of the things that you are learning right now does not mean that's the thing you're going to be doing forever. And so the output, um, I think it's valuable to reflect on the process that you are, the process that you are establishing for yourself and how that can be applied to things that change in the future, right? So um, how do you go about solving problems or asking questions or investigating things? Because I think this entire profession is so dictated um, and controlled by technology, which is moving at a speed that is um, only increasing. And so, you know, the things that the principles and things you're designing for today will be different by the time you graduate. So um, learning to, you know, being able to step back and understand and break down what your process is um, and then um, be rigorous in that is a really valuable skill. Now that takes a long time, um, but I think it's uh, um, it can be very easy for us to just turn the blinders on and just push stuff around in Illustrator or whatever software um, and then get to the end and not really reflect on how or why we got there. Um, I think that process is like the most valuable thing um, and, and, you know, worth, um, worth being able to take that bird's eye view every once in a while, because, you know, as you switch, as you move through different spaces, um, those will have huge influence on the work you make. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, um, I think we are out of time. Um, so, uh, thank you again for joining us, everyone. And thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for giving us a wonderful presentation. Yep, thanks. Thank you.